10 years to get a password. Um, so yeah. I think it's like pretty, um, you know, uh, I think we, a lot of the people who we think of as being heavily credentialed are actually kind of stupid. And uh, there are a lot of very well, you know, bookshelves are just leaning uh, under the weight of very, <laughs> of very intelligent authors and academics and other people, uh, including veterans, who, who have been to these other countries, know their people, know their cultures, uh, and who are not getting any calls uh, by any Democratic or Republican administration for their advice. Uh, so, um, you know, they're out. Those people are definitely out there. They're just not getting hired. And let me ask, uh, before I let you guys go, one quick question. These, these changes that Trump's making at the Pentagon, do, do they affect the... the incoming Biden team in any way? I mean, Biden's going to install his own people when he arrives, regardless of, of who is there uh, when he gets there, right? Or, you know, is Trump making it more difficult for Biden as he comes in? Uh, let me turn this to you, Dan. Well, I think so long as they don't do anything rash, like Star War, which obviously would affect Biden quite a bit coming in as president, I'm not sure that uh, he would have a hard time getting, you know, changing staff who have only been there for a few months or whatever. I, I really don't think that's going to be a big issue. The bigger issue is are these executive orders that Trump has signed that Biden wants to get uh, rid of. That That's going to be a difficult thing to untangle, but I don't think these staff moves will be, again, short of a new war. Mm-hmm. Author, Professor Dan Kavalik, before I let you go, where should our listeners go to find more of your work? Yes, well, I write on Counterpunch uh, for RT News, uh, Huffington Post, and you can check out my books at skyhorsepublishing.com. And cartoonist and columnist Ted Rawl, same to you. Uh, just go to my website, Rawl.com, R-A-L-L.com, and my latest book is Political Suicide, The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party. Hey, that's a, I like that title, Ted. That sounds cool. <laughs> All right, thanks to both of you for joining us here. And, of course, you heard them on Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik. We're live in D.C., and we'll be back right after this. Didn't recognize the name of the first person, did you? No. Shooting from the left. We're taking no prisoners here. Real opinions for real people. Raw? Oh, yeah. I know that one, but I meant the person before him. They had two people in there. Yeah, they asked the first one, where can we find your work? And he went on about counter punch and blah, blah, blah. Oh. There were two. Thank you, Michelle. It's a pleasure to chat with you again. Um, let me start by asking you about the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, Joe Biden, of course, can rejoin the accord on paper with a stroke of the pen, and he has promised to do so as he takes office. But I wondered if you could remind us of what that agreement binds us to, how far under Trump we might have shifted away from the emissions limits and funding promises we were supposed to adhere to, and what it's going to take, practically speaking, to pull us back into line. Well, the accord indicates that we want to hold the global average temperature at below 2C above the 1750 baseline. And the 
the real goal is to make an effort to keep it below one and a half degrees C above the 1750 baseline. And though both of those goals pose a significant challenge given that we are now above 2C, above the 1750 baseline, and there is no known way, including technology and social change, to re stabilize or reduce the global average temperature. So that's problematic. And we, of course, continue to move in the wrong direction, although the 2005 baseline is frequently used by the IP, I'm sorry, by the, by the Paris Climate Agreement, the Paris Accord. And we actually, in 2018, we were 10% below the 2005 baseline according to the EPA with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. And that's, I suspect, because of inherent variability that's built into the system, because from 2017 to 2018, emissions increased by 3.1%. And that was due to more electrical use primarily, because greater heating and cooling needs arose due to a colder winter and a hotter summer in 2018 as compared to the recent previous years. So, you know, it, obviously people are gonna keep heating their homes when it's cold and cooling their homes when it's hot. And how I, I can't imagine any politician running for office and saying that he wants you to do the opposite. So it, this, is, this is gonna pose some significant challenges. Let's put it that way. The, uh, the agreement is that it's a, it's a uh, you know, global agreement to try to achieve something that is actually not uh, possible? That's correct. You heard me correctly. That is exactly right. <laughs> and in fact, it was known at the time that to... it was known at the time the Paris Accord was written that we were above one and a half C, and now we know we're above two C. So, <laughs> yes, striving for the impossible has always been a particular challenge, I would say. Yeah, I mean, and I guess there is, there is something to be said for striving, you know, and the fact that I guess the world is unpredictable. But, yeah, I just wanted to be clear on that. Well, uh, I wonder if in the meantime, you know, we, we do have other countries who I guess are, you know, they have a... Uh, funding promises that they've made and emission caps they're supposed to be keeping to and other, uh, you know, monitoring um, uh, goals that they are supposed to hit. Can you, can you give us a sense of how well other countries over the last four years have been managing their compliance with the agreement? Well, of course, it's a mixed bag, as you might expect. You know, there are countries that are striving to be the next version of the United States, countries like China, for example, and they're burning coal like it's going out of style, maybe because it is going out of style. And so countries that are still in the stages of rapid development, such as China and India, as a result of a lot of people demanding a lot of stuff, are not coming anywhere close to the Paris Accord Agreement. And other countries that have never had so many people demanding so much stuff, they're doing a little better. But, you know, that shouldn't be a big surprise. There's a lot of variation from one country to the next out there. There's a lot of variation from one year to the next on what the weather brings. And all of these things come into play and make it incredibly challenging to make promises about, especially the relatively near-term future, as was done with the Paris Accord. Right. And just to, to come back to the U.S. for a minute, I mean, can you give us a sense of what Joe Biden, as, you know, if he returns us to this agreement as he's promised to basically on, on day one, what are the changes he's going to have to, to make? Is it different regulations on, on factories? Is it uh, establishing new uh, funding routines? Or, or is, is there sort of a whole climate infrastructure that existed when we entered the agreement that he can just sort of flick on? There's nothing. There is nothing to be done because there's nothing that can be done at the societal level or at the level of the country to turn this ship around. It, you know, the ship, the Titanic hit the iceberg and it's going down. And, uh, uh -huh. you know, what I suspect is that Biden will be in office 
when we have the first ice-free Arctic Ocean. And that alone will drive climate change enough in the really wrong direction and drive our species and probably all life on Earth to extinction. And so now is the worst time to be an incoming president because your history, to the extent there is any, is about to hit you with the with the hmm, cause for the loss of all life on Earth. Who wants to be in that position? No, I mean, maybe you should just let Trump stay. <laughs> that soon. Why are you predicting a, an ice-free Arctic that soon? It seems like, uh, well, I'm going to ask you that question and then say, why have I not seen anything about this? Am I just reading the, long, the wrong uh, sections of the newspaper? Or uh, do you have any comments on how these indicators are being covered? They're not being covered in, by the corporate media. There is no mention of an ice-free Arctic within the last five years. There's a wonderful paper written for and published by the Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences, published in 2012. It's by Vislav Maslovsky and colleagues. And it indicated that we would have an ice-free Arctic in 2016, plus or minus three years indicating that 2019 was the last year that might have happened. It didn't happen in 2019 and it didn't happen in 2020. However, the refreeze this year, 2020, has been stunningly slow. We are stuck at almost the exact same level of ice as we had at the end of the melt season toward the end of September. So here we are nearly two months later and we have almost the exact same level of ice in the Arctic as we did two months ago. The refreeze is just not progressing at all. And you can find the data for this on a variety of websites, National Snow and Ice Data Center, nsidc.com, I think, I'm not sure. But, and there are several other sites, JAXA and others that report the current level of ice in the Arctic and where it's been for the last weeks, months, and years going back to the satellite record dating to 1979. So it's unfortunate that we have to go to the effort to find this stuff ourselves instead of having it reported in the corporate media. But there's no advantage for the corporate media to tell people that we're about to lose habitat for human animals, that we're about to lose habitat for our favorite species in the history of the planet. Nobody's going to want to hear that. They might stop shopping. That's bad for business. <laughs> I mean, speaking of stopping shopping, uh, I mean, I taking of course on board your uh, your total pessimism about about the the Paris Agreement. Let me ask you about this one aspect of it, which is making finance flows consistent with a pathway toward low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. And uh, I want to ask, you know, with so many major economies, to a greater or lesser extent, but basically committed to the idea that profit is king and treating it, in fact, not so much as an idea, but as a natural law, I cannot see how there could be anything in this agreement that could achieve that goal of sending finance toward low greenhouse emissions and, and climate resilient development without first abandoning capitalism, because it would mean turning from something that is profitable right now to something that may be profitable in the future. No, you're absolutely right. And the I, I would argue that the issue is not capitalism per se, it's civilization, which is an even larger concept. And we all want to be civilized. We all claim to be civilized. And civilization has worked out great for many people so far, industrial civilization being the latest example of civilization. But bear in mind, there's a professor at the University of Utah by the name of Tim Garrett, who's published at least four peer-reviewed articles indicating that civilization is a heat engine. And, in the, and, and it gets worse than that. I'm, I'm going to quote here from a, paper, a peer-reviewed article in Nature Communications published July 7th of this year. The abstract indicates the inertia and internal variability of the climate system will delay the emergence of a discernible response even to strong, sustained mitigation. 
further pointing out that there is little or nothing we can do given the variation in the climate system and the in the the direction things are heading and the inertia with which things are heading in the wrong direction with respect to climate change so all of the peer-reviewed evidence indicates to me that we are headed in the wrong direction, that we've been headed in the wrong direction for at least 100 years, and that there is no known way to turn this around. Now, that said, I continue to work on, on projects that might actually pull off what I believe is the impossible, because that's what humans do, as we've already discussed. There's a project headed by Dr. Ye Tao at Harvard's Roland Center called the Mir Reflection Project. Mir, in this case, is spelled M-E-E-R. If you go to mirreflection.com, you can find out what, what the prospects are. Now, interestingly, it wouldn't take a tremendous amount of money to get that project underway, and it's the only project I think that is capable of cooling or stabilizing planetary temperature. It hasn't generated much interest, but I think it's, and, and I've been talking with Dr. Tao for more than a year now, I think it's the only reasonable approach that actually has it pointed in the right direction. And instead, what I see is people talking about the impossibility of reducing global average temperature through things like agriculture and turning down our thermostat and all those things that we have not been willing to do for the last hundred years or so. Hmm. Let me ask you, uh, you know, with that pro interesting project remaining out there as a, as a potential uh, global scale solution, um, is it safe to guess then that you would say for an incoming Biden administration, your approach to, you know, to, to the climate and to EPA is to, to make it a sort of, uh, local level harm reduction model. Yes. And so in that sense, like focus on pollution, focus on local environment, focus on local flora and fauna. Is that a reasonable guess? Would you agree? Yes, absolutely. I think relocalization, going back to how we used to live for the first hundred, few hundred thousand years as humans, is a great idea. And and I suspect that will be met with great resistance. And I like to fly as much as the next person. You know, I like to go to other places and see people I haven't seen for a long time. So don't get me wrong, I love that stuff. But it's time to implement planetary hospice. It's time to rip off the bandage and admit to people that we are in dire circumstances. It's time to tell people that now is the time to love, not the time to hate, not the time to go to war and so on. Right. So let me ask you about uh, the people that are coming in with Joe Biden. Uh, <laughs> it's a very unluckily timed presidency, according to your predictions. Uh, I'm told that his EPA and energy agency review teams are chock full of climate experts. Uh, but I also see a fellow with close ties to DuPont, who an intercept report reminds us uh, that helps, dodge, uh, helps DuPont dodge responsibility and fines over a harmful chemical that they were um, emitting. And I also see someone with close ties to this Carbon 180 organization that um, seems to be devoted to car carbon capture and turning carbon into an asset. And I, I wonder if you've had a chance to look at Biden's incoming teams and, and what you think of the personnel there. Well, a couple of things. Of course, there has been a very strong tie between the corporate world and the United States government for a long time. It shouldn't surprise us that this is going to continue under the Biden administration. We'll, we'll call it Obama light. And Obama was kind of noted for his drill baby drill approach when it came to oil and coal. So, and natural gas. So it shouldn't come as a big surprise that there are climate experts on the review team and review teams and there are also people with close ties to among the most polluting corporate entities in the history of this country. So, so that's the bad news. And might there be some good news that arises? Of course. And again, I would turn to 
honesty as being the approach the Biden administration can take if they're so inclined. Will they? It would surprise me that hasn't really been the hallmark of American presidents for a long time. But maybe in having a good idea of what comes, what is likely to come in the future, maybe Biden will be the one who will step up and will tell people that it's time to tear off the bandage. It's time to tell people that every species goes extinct and that mammals and vertebrates are going extinct at an astonishing rate at this point. And, and since we are vertebrate, man vertebrate mammals, we might have reason to be concerned about that. In addition to the, uh, the Mirror Reflection Project, anywhere else you'd like to direct our listeners' attention to before I let you go? Well, of course, you can go to my work at GuyMcPherson.com, which points to projects that might have a, the proverbial snowball's chance, including the Mirror Reflection program. And recently, hmm, Dr. Tao, who heads that program, has connected with Leslie Fields of Stanford. And she is working on a project that is completely complementary with the Mirror Reflection Project. And so there are places that one can go to find out what's happening. But Unfortunately, those places almost never include the corporate media, which I find very disappointing. And I certainly am pleased that you're willing to have the conversation, Ms. Witte, that few other people are willing uh, to have. Well, we're always delighted to have you on. That was Professor Guy McPherson. Thank you so much. And with that, we're going to take a break and get into our second hour of news, politics, and culture. We're going to look at the passing of the political torch from boomers to millennials and whether that means anything. We're going to talk about the impact of the pandemic on education, and we'll look at Biden's tech-heavy transition team. There's a lot coming up. You'll hear it right here on Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> 